Good evening, everybody. Hello, thank you for coming. I am Alicia Schwartz. I am the Friends of Art Curatorial Research Associate at the Davis Museum. And I just wanted to extend a welcome to all of our guests who are here with us in person and also all of those who are joining us over Zoom. We're delighted to have you all with us. Um, please also, if you're on Zoom, check the chat for information about the webinar format and for questions at the end. We open all of our programs here at the Davis with an important acknowledgement. Um, here we go. Okay. Um, for all those who are on Zoom, here is how to participate. Uh, and we open all of our programs at the Davis with an land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Wellesley College is built on ancestral and traditional land of the Massachusetts people. We also recognize that the United States removal, termination, and assimilation policies and practices resulted in the forced settlement of indigenous lands and the attempted erasure of indigenous cultures and languages. We further acknowledge the oppression, injustices, and discrimination that indigenous people have endured and that there's much work to be done on the important journey to reconciliation. We commit to strength, strengthen our understanding of the history and contemporary lives of indigenous peoples and to steward this land. We further recognize that many indigenous people living here today, including the Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and Nimfuck nations who have rich ancestral histories in Wellesley and its surrounding communities. Today, their descendants remind us that they are still here, where they maintain a vital and visible presence. We honor and respect the enduring relationship between these peoples and this land, as well as the strength of indigenous culture and knowledge, the continued existence of tribal sovereignty, and the principle of tribal self-determination. And now, I have the pleasure to introduce our director, Elisa Fishman, the Ruth Gordon Shapiro Director of the Gates Museum. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, good. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. <laughs> this is a very exciting event, and I'm delighted to see you here. Um, I think we're all a little bit rusty on the in-person event situation. Uh, but I appreciate you coming, and it's really a pleasure to have you in the house. Um, a little bit about the Prilla Smith Brackett Award. The biennial Prilla Smith Brackett Award supports a female identified artist whose work and exhibition record demonstrate extraordinary artistic vision, talent, and skill. Recipients receive a $15,000 cash award to be used for travel, research, project development, or any other expenses related to career advancement. The inaugural award was given in 2019, and the recipient is with us tonight. And the second iteration was delayed a year due to the global pandemic. I would like to thank the 2022 cohort of jurors, Amanda Gilbin, who is our Sonia Novak Kerner, class of 1951, senior curator of collections and assistant director of curatorial affairs, who couldn't be with us this evening. David Tang Olson, who is Associate Professor in the Art Department at Wellesley College. This is our <coughs> friend Dave. And Yu Wen Wu, who is the recipient of the inaugural Prilla Smith Brackett Award in 2019. Thank you for being here. And thank you for your work on our behalf of this award. Big thanks to Alicia Latorres, the Friends of our Curatorial Research Associate, who has so capably administered the Brackett Award program from its inception and without whose organizational acumen and invaluable input, we could not have reached success with the jury process. Big thanks also to Serena Conreddy, media specialist, for all of her work behind the scenes, producing the video segments for each of the three finalists, amplifying their work via the Davis website and YouTube channels, and organizing this evening's webinar. And many thanks to our student Bracket Award assistant, Emma Sullivan, who is class of 2024, who's worked with Alicia to support the administration of the award. And from uh, beginning in the spring all the way forward to tonight, and who worked with Serena so capably to interview the finalists and who is with us this evening supporting the event online. This is only the second edition, as it were, of the Bracket Award and the jury's process was challenging. 
given the many fine candidates and the number that we had to review, we had hard decisions to make. It was also enormously gratifying. Let me say how extraordinary this is as an opportunity for us as jurors. We meet so many artists through the Bracket Award process, and we come away with at least a sliver snapshot of the artist's ecosystem in the greater Boston area. In the first round, we reviewed 130 applications and agreed unanimously on three outstanding finalists. And it is a pleasure to recognize them here tonight. Lynn Allen, who is with us. <laughs> Alison Maria Rodriguez, who is also with us. And Lynn Hilton, who is our recipient this year. Last summer, we did virtual studio visits, which is awkward for the best of them, <laughs> but everyone held up very well. Uh, we did those visits and reviewed the short videos that Emma and Serena had made. You'll find these on the Davis Museum's YouTube channel, and I highly recommend. Our decision was a difficult one, given the strength of the finalists. We were unanimous again in our appreciation of Maria Matheny's innovative practice. For their distinctive conceptual obsessions. That's my writing. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and unique approaches to making. And we are thrilled to honor them with the Prilla Smith Bracket Award. Most importantly, let me voice our great thanks to Prilla Smith Bracket right here. Prilla's vision and generosity that make this award possible. Prilla Smith Brackett is herself an artist and is best known for working with landscape conceptually, depicting more than a description of a place. Brackett has exhibited throughout the Eastern US, including a solo show traveling to eight venues in New England and the Mid-Atlantic States. Other venues include the De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum, the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, DC, the Art <coughs> Complex Museum in Massachusetts, and the Hanoi Contemporary Arts Center in Vietnam. Her work is in the collections of Harvard University Art Museums, the New Britain Museum of American Art, the Danforth Art Museum, the Worcester Art Museum, and the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Her honors include a finalist award in painting from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, residencies at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and the Ragdale Foundation, an award and residency at the UCross Foundation, an Earthwatch Artist Award in Madagascar, and a fellowship in painting at the Bunting Institute of Radcliffe College. Born in New Orleans, Brackett has social science degrees from Sarah Lawrence College and the University of California, Berkeley. She earned her MFA in drawing and painting from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She added printmaking to her practice in 2003. Brackett lives and works in Boston, Massachusetts. Join me in welcoming for Liz Smith Brackett to the podium. Thank you, Lisa. I think it would be easier to talk without this on. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> I'm so excited to be here for the celebration of Maria Molteni the gifted, hardworking artist receiving the second cycle of this award. Congratulations. Maria, may your creativity and ambitions flourish. I'm deeply grateful to all the staff of the Davis who are committed to this award and who made the process of administering it this year work so well. I wanna tell you a little bit about how this award evolved. Feminism in the early 1970s and 80s was hugely influential for me. I was an early subscriber to Ms. Magazine and worked hard with my husband to create as egalitarian a mar marriage as we could and raise two feminist sons. After I transitioned from work in the social science and social action, my first drawing teacher in San Francisco was the artist Eleanor Dickinson married with children and an active feminist. She had researched statistics on the woeful representation of female artists in all measures of career success in visual arts 
and became a powerful role model. When my husband and I moved to Lincoln, Nebraska in 1976 with two very young children, I decided to return to school in drawing and painting, ultimately spending two years getting undergraduate art credits and then completing the three-year MFA program at University of Nebraska, Lincoln. The first person I talked to was a male art historian who told me, quote, we don't look favorably at married women coming back to school, unquote. I was, at a, I was an at-large member of the newly formed Women Caucus for Art and found support from other women artists in Lincoln. So I kept my head down, did my work, and juggled parenting young kids. At my orals five years later, with three men and two feminists on my committee, I felt free for the first time to say openly what I wanted to say about my thesis work. Fast forward. In 2014, seeing the statistics from the National Museum of Women in the Arts was a good wake up call, confirming my lived experience. 51% of working artists were women, only 5% of art in US museum collections were by women. 28% of museum solo shows featured women. 25% of New York galleries shows were by women and 10% of artists featured in printed monograph books were women. Some improvement from Eleanor Dickinson's statistics from the mid 1970s, but not a lot. Obviously, like at least 95% of all artists, I haven't realized recognition at the top levels. Being woman, a woman and now an older one is clearly a factor. I had grown up in a family which valued the idea of leaving the world a better place than you found it. And I had worked on civil rights, social justice and political causes during my adult life. I wondered, what I could do to make a difference with, for women artists in my community, knowing that I had some funds I could use. The process of figuring out what made sense, making connections, inquiries, and a false start or two took about four years. I grew into the role of being a donor with something to give. I wanted a museum with a permanent collection, including contemporary art, that would give more prestige to the awardee. When I approached the award, when I approached the Davis, Lisa Fishman and Claire Whitner, then chief curator, were enthusiastic about engaging with, the, with contemporary women artists in Boston. We worked out the details together. I wanted artists to be able to apply without having to be nominated. I wanted there to be active outreach in communities of color in order to be part of breaking down racism in Boston and in Boston's art world, and to reach all women identifying, all artists identifying as women in all stages of their career. Lisa suggested that each awardee be paid a, a paid member of the jury for the next award cycle, and that the award be a biennial offering more money than an annual award could. Both ideas added to the prestige of the award. We found that our concerns meshed well. In September 2019, we celebrated Yu Wen Wu, the first awardee, and heard her present her work. Now, after a year off due to COVID, we celebrate Maria, Maria Molten, excuse me, Maria Molteni, <laughs> and look forward to her talk tonight. I'm so grateful that this award is developing a life of its own now powered by the Davis staff. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Uh, it is now my great pleasure to introduce Maria, the winner of the 2022 Carlos McBracket Award. Maria Molteni is a queer transdisciplinary artist, educator, and mystic. They are the grandchild of Tennessee square dancers, stunt motorcyclists, quilters, beekeepers, and opera singers of various European backgrounds. Their practice has grown from formal studies in painting, printmaking, and dance to incorporate research, ritual, and play-based collaboration. On notification of the award, Molteni said, 
This support will allow me space to breathe, dream, and focus on my research and my more experimental practices on the back of many years of near burnout. I'm a tactical hustling artist who relies on my body and limited resources to complete physically ambitious works. Financial support lifts some of this pressure so that I can seek balance between productivity and inspiration. As I'm allowed to center and expand, the content of my work will deepen and my practice will become more sustainable. I am deeply grateful for this gift, which all artists deserve to have. So in her own words, Maria Multani.
aqui. I thought um, I just play that as a little bit of a cleanse. <laughs> it's like a kind of like a meditation. It hopefully takes some of my nerves, calms my nerves down a little bit. <laughs> it's a little long, but um, thanks for watching. So um, I am going to do some things in a slightly different order than I planned. So I'm going to skip ahead because also time is not linear nor real. So. I'm going to read a bit about this piece. I'm going to probably go back and forth a bit between reading and chatting, uh, free chatting um, throughout. Um, so this work I created for the Momentary in Benton, Arkansas in 2020, which is kind of a miracle considering 2020 what was happening, of course. Um, this groundwork is inspired by the history of the moment Momentary site as a formal, former apple orchard. Venusian rosacea explores the myriad of colors, shapes, and symbols associated with apples. Stretching 50 feet in diameter, the circular composition includes layers of five pointed stars and infinitely connecting braids, referencing the pentagonal shape of an apple's core and the dance of Venus, a map of the movement of Venus and Earth around the sun. This work, like most of my ground murals, serves as an altar to the sky, as well as a radically horizontal approach to public monuments. For myself, the 2020 Venus retrograde from May 13th to June 25th of 2020 was particularly significant as it coincided with the COVID era Black Lives Matter uprisings across the globe. During this time, Venus was stationed retrograde in the sign of Gemini for the first time since 2012, which was the Occupy era. Venus, the planet of values, justice, and relationships, challenged us to review our own codes of ethics and take action in the world to back them up. Venusian Rosacea invites visitors to center the peace with their minds and bodies, encouraging the individual, individual reflection and group responsibility through cycles of power and resistance. This work also references Agnes Martin's Wheel of Life, I often return to this particular passage from The Untroubled Mind, which gives me much inspiration and frustration. So Agnes's words. That's a good. Uh, Nature is the wheel. When you get off the wheel, you're looking out. You stand with your back to the turmoil. Classicists are people that look out with their back to the world. To a detached person, the complication of the involved life is like chaos. If you don't like the chaos, you're a classicist. If you like it, you are a romanticist. Agnes overcame her lifelong battle with schizophrenia while managing a highly successful art career by exercising visionary classicism and mindfulness. Her mission was to find peace in her own mind. Her paintings sought to provide others with a place to look out and rest during moments like a Venus retrograde, I ask myself, can I do both? Look toward the center and out into space, create space, spaces for action and for rest. Shouldn't we seek a balance between looking inward and outward? Perhaps like the blooming Taurus, there is no hard line between the internal and external. The work, this work is dedicated to Queen Morgan, a trans femme acquaintance of mine, uh, a trans femme acquaintance of mine and close friend of my assistant Randy's. We learned of Morgan's passing just before the mural was created and continually read about the character Morgan, the queen of death in Apple mythology. This work is also dedicated to baby Rose, my firstborn baby niece who entered the world on the day we started painting. Rosie shares a birth chart and namesake with the work. That when I say birth chart, I mean astrological birth chart and namesake with, namesake with the work, since roses and apples are both in the Rosaceae family. This work stands by the ever-blooming spectrum of femme identities and matriarchal muses. And I want to say thanks to Reed Wilson uh, for creating the original music for the video that you heard or that you watched. Reed utilized the frequencies of the planet Venus and apple blossoms, which are 
uh, 221.23 hertz and 639.4 hertz, respectively, along with guitar synthesizer singing bowl and singing bowls to evoke the mood of um, working on and experiencing the piece. He was also in, he also incorporated sounds that would call in the cicada friends around the piece and the ritual ringing of a golden apple bell that we used in painting the process in the painting process. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about that piece, and here's some of the visitors to it in Arkansas. Um, yeah, well, you know, one to kind of illustrate the the vast spectrum of um, of identities that uh, might include the word woman or, or women. Um, and, and how gender expansiveness is being included into that. Um, and also um, to show that I actively work with a lot of um, spirits of, uh, you know, deceased, um, not always deceased actually, but, you know, ancestral guides that were uh, women artists that I look up to. So Agnes Martin is, is someone that I petition to frequently. I'm just gonna go back in time a little. Um, and, um, Another that I um, that I feel very close to is Nikki de Saint Paul. Um, so again, I'm just gonna, I don't want to read at y'all, but I will definitely not stay on time if I start <laughs> free chatting. So um, uh, well, first I was going to say, okay, so I talk a lot about astrology. It's something that I study among other things. Um, and this happens to be my Jupiter year, um, which is a little, a little bit advanced astrology, so I won't explain it, but it's my, it's my Jupiter year. Jupiter is like the big lucky planet that expands things. And for me, it expanded my sense of abundance and also my hardships. Um, it really uh, brought into light certain uh, health problems I was having and kind of expanded the symptoms of those. Um, but it was the first year that I've ever gotten a substantial grant. And I actually received two. The first one became a safety net when I lost all of my income because of a health emergency. Um, after 15 years of applying in three different categories for an MCC grant, I did get a painting award. Um, and so when I got the Perla Smith Brackett Award, um, it so so the, so receiving the first grant, I felt more like the safety net, like my like I had um, a, a sort of chance to survive the rest of my year. Um, but when I received this grant, I really felt the sense of abundance. Um, and, but I also kind of felt myself spiraling a little bit. And first of all, um, it's because, you know, I thought of the other two finalists and how deep, deeply deserving of this money that they are as well. And how much both Allison and Lim have supported me in my work um, and have also just been such inspiring models as artists for me. Um, and, you know, we'd all been through a lot together already with like the social media and the um, interviews and everything. And so I was thinking of this and thinking about how all artists deserve this um, and we all need this. Um, but it was also uncomfortable in a way because I realized that, that when um, you sit so long in a place of um, maybe of, of receiving denials, that um, you start to wonder if you really deserve the support. And so it can be a little uncomfortable when you start to actually receive like the kind of love and support that you've wanted for, for many years. And this is like, you know, in grant worlds, but emotional, you know, it's all of these different ways. Um, and so I made like some voice notes about how I was feeling and this is sort of vulnerable and messy, and, um, but I appreciate you sharing that space with me. Um, so like many artists, um, Maybe it's too vulnerable, actually, <laughs> for right now. But I would love to have these conversations with people um, separately. I'll just say it's it's complicated being an artist out here in the world. And 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 the the summary of what I was going to say is, especially being um, a woman and anyone who falls under this kind of identity of these expanding identities. Um, we expand and contract a lot. We take up space and we take up less space. We, we um, ask for abundance and then we make do with what we have and we're resourceful and we're um, all kinds of things and, um, and we provide. And, um, and it's exhausting, just the expanding and contracting is exhausting. And I do think it's something that is not, um, not only women go through, but I think a lot of women go through this. Um, and it's something that I've been feeling and is why, um, I just feel very, very grateful for this for this um, award, and I think all all, all artists deserve it. 
Um, thanks for letting me wobble through that a little. <laughs> um, and then I was going to say that next year is my Saturn year. So next year um, I will be um, tested to create sustainable structures and boundaries in my life. Um, so what I plan to show you today is both, or tonight is both what I um, applied with and the application, but also um, I wanted to show, share with you some of the stuff I'm working on and how I'm already starting to use these funds to try to create a more sustainable future for my practice. Um, so speaking of Nikki de Saint-Fall, here we are again. On the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn on December 21st, 2021, I climbed to the top of a sacred shaker mountain where I've been doing research since 2018. I went with a friend named Angel. I placed focused attention on a, request, on a request from the universe to expand my work to find my site of pilgrimage under the guidance of Nikki de Saint-Fall to make my version of her tarot garden. And when I say that, I don't mean like really like the same thing, but I want to make my pilgrimageable public uh, sacred site. Um, I visited the uh, Nikki de Saint Falls Tarot Garden in Tuscany this past summer. I cried into the fountain of the high priestess and dipped my rosary in her waters and was gifted a double rainbow. It's hard to see the double, but I promise <laughs> it was there. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we, we had a, a brief bio about me already, but I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and I like to say that athletics like religion are a dominant area for culture that generate monumental attention and emotional investment. I grew up ritually shooting free throws and praying the rosary, taught to do both by a bead, by bead slinging, basketball dunking, Dominican nuns. Um, these are, this was from an NPR story they did in Nashville, like of the, the nuns from the campus. <laughs> I went to. This is really how it was. Um, my current uh, mystical practices have branched far from the strictly Catholic upbringing, but I was still call. I still recall helpful non-binary structures such as the Holy Trinity that informed my queer identity today. My fondness of the ocean and island lore, which will come up later, particularly myths about near alien femme beings like mermaids and sirens, further shape my complex expressions of gender and embodiment. So what I usually tell people is like, we were kind of being taught this thing on the left and I was kind of seeing it like this as a child and I was fine with that and still am. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And even though I am not, um, I'm not like a traditional type of practicing Catholic, I still feel a closeness to the, um, the you know, infinite goddess is what I, I call them now, but you know, of, of the, the Holy Mother, Earth Mother Mary and all of the different names for Mary. So a lot of my work ends up being about Mary too. Um, so, so if, like a lot of my work has been about athletics. I'm going to skip over a lot of the stuff. I, there's plenty of lectures out there about um, my collective, the New Craft Artists in Action. Um, but it actually started from like a deeply spiritual, personal place. A lot of the work about basketball that I've made, and then eventually expanded into becoming um, a collective that has done um, extensive community engaged projects all over the world, um, but a lot in Massachusetts. Um, so the New Craft Artists in Action, uh, NCAA, are a cycling um, collective, um, you know, with like cycling membership um, that I've been like kind of like the creative director of for uh, at least 12 years. And <clears throat> we started by making these handmade basketball nets. Um, but I started realizing, so we also um, kind of started the uh, national basketball court painting movement that has um, has really grown and spread. And I started realizing that um, a lot of this felt rooted in my undergrad painting education that I got from Dana Clancy and also with the support of Lynn Allen. Um, you know, BU uh, is, a, is a, quite a painting school and there's a lot of emphasis on, on sort of action painting and abstract expressionism. This is a clip from a workshop I did with teens in Denver um, called Ab Exorcism, um, where we tried to exercise toxic masculinity from the history of art, just a small assignment. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, it was really fun because we ended up making these painting implements out of athletic equipment and I built an arena for them covered in fabric and they had, you know, so much time to, to activate the arena. We cut the fabric up, turned, to, turned them into team jerseys, 
I wasn't really intending to present on this whole project, but it made me realize that I'm trying to, if Pollock was, you know, making the, the painting into an, an, a, into an arena in which to act, um, I like to make the arena into a painting. Um, this is just an example of what we, what we came out with, but so, so I, I've been making these um, community engaged and, and pretty like um, pretty radically um, collaborative, community collaborative uh, basketball courts for some years. And I'm just gonna blow through them real quick. <laughs> um, but this was the first one in Dorchester um, where we you know, invited kids to like literally draw on chalkboards. And it was almost like a made to order, like just paint their designs in on the spot. Um, this was at Talbot Middle School. This is gonna come back up soon. I have a really cool announcement about this that no one's really heard yet. Um, this is Talbot Mil Middle School in Fall River. Um, the really special thing about this court is that we painted, we started painting it on the Aries full moon, um, which always happens during Libra season in October. Um, but we, painted the um, astrological natal chart so that like a, a place or an object can be born just um, just like a, a human or animal can. And so we painted the chart that marked the, the court's birth into the center of the court. And so it has an, uh, an Aries moon, which is Aries is known for being really youthful and vibrant and playful and competitive and actually pretty athletic. I have an Aries moon. I also have an Aries sun. I share these things with the basketball court um, and, and <laughs> Libra. I mean, sorry, not Aries. I have an Aries moon. I have a Libra sun. Um, and Libra is known for friendship and harmony and balance and fairness, which it is why it's squeamish for me to even receive an award. Um, however, the combination of those things makes for a very um, healthy basketball <laughs> environment for young people. Um, so that's that court. This is in um, New Bedford, uh, you know, which has a really rich and trauma traumatic uh, whaling history. I think a lot about the piece downstairs with like the old pan panoramic pa uh, paintings of, of like whaling expeditions feels really connected to that gorgeous piece. Um, uh, so we asked the kids, uh, we put chalkboards on the wall and we said, you know, what do you think we, we wanted to kind of center the whale and we said, what do you think that whales like deep down in the ocean are trying to communicate to creatures in the sky because we started I started realizing that these basketball courts really were like altars to the sky as well. And I started imbuing more of this like sort of mysticism and magic and imagination into them. Um, and so they, um, I taught them how to write in nautical flag because there's a nautical flag for every letter of the alphabet. And they wrote secret messages um, from the whales to the birds and aliens and et cetera um, into the court. I'm glad this is so saturated. And we started, um, I mean, this was the first time I've ever signed anything. <laughs> because I forget to do that, but realize, okay, well, if I'm signing the court, then we should acknowledge the land it's on in some way and really think about this whole situation. If we think about the sky, we should think about the land. Um, so started to sign the, for the land as well. Um, I'm going to get back to a seabird if I have time, because this, so this is the first um, court that I did um, like during COVID, so the community um, participation was limited, but that also gave me the opportunity to um, really dig into my own cosmology. Um, so I'll come back to that. And this is just an example of a wall I've done because I just want people to know I do walls too. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I would love to paint your wall. Um, but this is the first painting I ever made in my life actually from when I was seven. Um, my aunt, my aunt gave me paint for my paint and a canvas for, for my seventh birthday. So I painted the number seven and the word seven and there's seven stars and seven, like basically ended up painting kind of the Pleiades constellation, which is what this piece is about. And I kind of realized that, um, the, the Pleiades are the seven sisters. This piece is about seven sisters. So we already covered this gal. So I'm just going to move on. Um, but one other cool thing that happened in 2020 was I started really thinking about double vision. And this is another piece I could talk about 
pretty much all of these pieces each for an hour. So I'm not going to go way into this. Um, I do have a, a lecture about it on my Patreon. You're welcome to look into that if you want. But um, basically, <clears throat> the the piece that actually opened in 2020 before um, the pandemic came to us um, was this piece about House Bauhaus and a show called After Spiritualism that Allison had an, a gorgeous piece and we were like so excited to be show neighbors. And I feel like that was when we also got close, which is cool. Um, and now we're real neighbors, <laughs> if you want. Um, and so this piece um, became about like stereoscopy and this idea of looking at two different things, uh, looking at something through two different lenses to, to then get a more enhanced final image. So stereoscopy, stereoscopes, like the first, they're the first 3D vision, like um, 3D photography. You could say where you, you look through um, and you see two images slightly offset from one another and then it kind of creates like a, a, um, an enhanced sort of 3D image. And I was using it to compare two different histories of both the Bauhaus, um, German Bauhaus school and a, a small structure that was built at the beginning of American spiritualism in Lilydale, New York, that was called the Bauhaus, like as in the house of boughs, tree boughs. So this piece is called Bauhaus, Bauhaus. And it just made me realize mostly, so this is the, the house of boughs the first structure built for spirit mediums to orate off of um, in Lilydale, New York, in a community that I'm still traveling to every year for a, um, a conference about spiritualism that I'll be speaking at this year. Um, and um, in the uh, stereographs that I printed, um, risograph printed, um, I drew portraits of different uh, early sort of activists and participants in each movement that have since um, been overlooked or forgotten. Um, and so there are portraits um, of them and there's a lot of documentation of it on my Instagram and my website. Um, if you want to actually read about the individual people. These are just some examples. And a lot of them were, were women, um, people of color, trans people. Um, so this just sets up how basically a way that I started to think about my artwork. It's like a lot of times I'm using, I'm talking about things that seem separate, but I'm, I'm trying to find either the common ground between them or sort of a more enhanced, enhanced image that you can make. Uh, when you put them together. So these are just some of the juxtapositions you could say, or the synthesis things I'm synthesizing. So examples are architecture and astrology, the sea and the sky, as above, so below, shipwreck and gentrification, land and the body, quilting and mapping, queerness and tennis. <laughs> Shout out to my mom, who's a really good tennis player and might be watching right now. <laughs> Um, and, and those are inspired by her tennis panties that she's wearing, by the way. I thought they were magic. I didn't know where the balls were coming from. <laughs> um, ab expressionism, ab exercises, um, basketball and craft, honeybees and shakers, which is a big one. And um, these are just more pictures of these, more pictures of these. Um, so I, this, was, this was a major part of my application. I intentionally decided I'm not, I'm not going to start giving a long lecture about the shakers because I won't stop and I know myself. So I'm just going to like kind of glaze over this too. But um, this is a, um, this, this piece, Unseen Hours, was a, was a show that was at the Fruitlands Museum um, curated by Shana Dumont Gar. Um, it was a project we, I worked on since about 2017. Like it took a lot of change. It shape shifted a lot because of COVID and we thought it was going to be canceled and all of this. We ended up making a film called The Sacred Sheets. Um, my, we being my collaborators, Allison Halter and um, cinematographer Gabe Elder. Um, and it's a 17 minute film that um, I can't wait to show in other contexts. Um, and so maybe one day you'll see the full film. But um, Basically, okay, I'm just gonna to read to you quickly about the Shakers. The Shakers, known for building spiritual intentional communities across the United States, arrived from Manchester, England with their leader, Mother Anne Lee in 1776. While Lee is often hailed as Holy Mother Wisdom or second coming of Christ in female form, 
Schaefer brothers and sisters were ordinary people who opted to forgo their families and worldly possessions in order to enter into an extraordinary egalitarian community where all property was held in common. In keeping with a popular Shaker phrase, hands to work, hearts to God, each day was filled with the disciplined physical and spiritual tasks of transforming the earth into heaven. Today, Shakers are considered the longest running American utopian experiment. Their early adopted nickname, Shaking Quakers, referred to organized and freeform styles of dance worship, which they called laboring. Alternatively, prayer was called exercise. Their marching, singing, whirling, and clapping were carefully constructed activities held within their own sacred spaces as a way to shake off sin or express joy and devotion. While known for their celibacy, Shakers remained present in their bodies, despite a long lineage of Christian faiths divorcing the body and spirit. While widely known for their fervent worship styles, strict celibacy and excellent design, a brief period of their history known as the era of manifestations brought forth exceptionally fruitful spirit communication. From roughly 1837 to 57, first generation Shakers such as early elder leader, Mother Ann Lee, believed to be the second coming of Christ as Holy Mother Wisdom, appeared to younger instruments who channeled their messages. Visual recordings of these correspondences are now known as the gift drawings or mother's work. So the, the spiritualist community, Lily Dale, I was talking about has an annual um, conference called the Science of Things Spiritual. And I'm going to be giving a lecture there about the shaker, shaker era of manifestations. So if you're curious about that, I can send you that later, but um, it's its own lecture um, for sure. So um, I love the gift drawings, particularly this series called the Sacred Sheets, um, because they kind of sit between a couple of different forms of shaker gift drawings um, that are text-based and others that are more painterly. So this is like a, the sacred sheets exhibit a spirit, like a form of spirit writing that um, Samantha Wicks, I mean, Samantha Fairbanks and Mary Wicks participated in together in 1843. Um, so it almost looks like they're writing alphabets or language, but you can't really tell what they're writing. So at Fruitlands um, and, and I, a lot of my work about shakers and honeybees involves the fact that they're like these matriarchal societies that do ecstatic dancing and live in these tidy white boxes, labor into <laughs> all these things that on and on and on. a whole essay about that too. Um, but so I chose a drawing um, of the sacred sheets that I think looks a bit like honeybee waggle dancing patterns and recreated it in milk painted, like handmade milk painted cut paper on the floor of the Shaker house at Fruitlands. And then um, my collaborator, Allison Halter, who is a, a fabulous per performance artist and broom maker made uh, traditional Shaker style brooms. And we did sort of a broom um, choreographic ritual that became the film that we are calling the sacred sheets. So here are some stills from it as well our show at Fruitlands. Um, yeah, this work means a lot to me. Worked on it for a very long time. I'm very proud of everyone who worked on it. Um, I think I have the. I think I have the trailer for the end if there's time. And um, one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning about Nikki de Saint Fall, when I was talking about her tarot garden, is that. Um, one of the reasons I admire her, besides the fact that she made this incredible, um, this incredible, you know, this um, pilgrimage place, that site that you pilgrimage to, that's supposed to be kind of like Parkway, Gaudi's Parkway. Um, she did all kinds of creative fundraising for her projects, and she created series like she created perfumes and stickers and tarot cards and scarves and all kinds of things to raise money for her very massive projects. And so I've been trying to also follow that influence and create more um, like multiples and things that I can sell but that still have um, conceptual and creative um, like richness to them. So I, I'm also showing all of the projects with the, with the thing I then made to, to sell with it. Sense. Um, so, th so this is the book that came with Unseen Hours, and it has um, essays by myself and my collaborators, and um, and almost all these things are. I'm going to be selling them at the Boston Art Book Fair in a few weeks. So, 
Um, okay, so this piece, um, this is a, the, the basketball court, a seabird that I showed you earlier. Um, I've been, it's related to this, this work I've been doing with Our, Our Lady of Good Voyage Chapel, um, in, which was torn down in South Boston, I think in 2018, um, for years. Um, I just feel really close to the church, the, the nautical history. Um, I'm on like the, a, a rowing team, an ocean rowing team in Boston that um, emerged out of, uh, or evolved out of shipwreck lifesavers. And I feel very tied to a lot of this history. I also really like the chapel because it feels very matriarchal. Um, and also like you can see in some of the stained glass windows and some of the imagery inside, <clears throat> all the, the Marys and Jesus, I, Jesus, I, Jesus, um, are not all white, like white, um, and I think that's cool too. Um, so I knew this building was going to be torn down for many years, and there was a lot of back and forth about what would happen. They ended up actually rebuilding the church, and it is quite beautiful, but for a long time that they didn't have plans to do that, and it was this very humble, tiny church across from the ICA for many years that would sit kind of empty, which selfishly I liked because I would go in there and, and pray the rosary by myself. I have like a complex long-term relationship with the rosary, um, which I'll get to. And so I was very sad when it was going to be torn down and I decided to do a lot of like rituals um, in and around it um, in its last years and days. Um, so this is after the church was gutted um, and then I, I showed up when it was being torn down um, and documented that. Um, and then a few, a couple or a few years later, the um, you know neighborhood um, company that has basically gentrified all of the seaport invited me to do a mural, um, not in the exact space, but just about a block down from the church. So you know, that was complex. I mean, of course, I think they should be hiring local artists um, to do to do artwork. And they have made a lot of cool decisions, like creative decisions in the neighborhood, but everyone knows what's happened with the seaport. Um, and most of the artists have been driven out of it. And um, several of us here live in one of the last existing artist buildings, um, like affordable artist buildings in Boston. Um, so just a few blocks down from the church, um, they wanted me to paint the basketball court. And I said, well, okay, but I am going to make it about this building that you tore down. And they were okay with that. I mean, you know, the way I pitched it, hopefully, <laughs> helped. <laughs> but, um, and so, so this piece is called a seabird um, because I developed a lot of like my like my own personal cosmology around this Mary, this idea of Mary or the sea goddess or the sea goddess or sea queen, and I call it the seabird, um, partially because in the tale <clears throat> myth of the sirens, they they were actually birds, um, and so this piece is dedicated to to the church and to her. Um, and includes a lot of um, imagery from the dock where I row just down the street and um, the nautical flag alphabet. Um, and I actually hid, when you can see the, well, these are just examples of like, just to see how intense this labor really is and what it's like to like paint on the ground. Um, and also just to show that I don't really view this work as commercial art, you know, um, I think that had, it has been difficult to pitch my work for applications and things over the years because I think people see murals as commercial work and sometimes they are, but I really think of this as my, my painting practice, like back from when I was an oil painter um, with Dana <laughs> at BU. Um, and, you know, these are some of the amazing um, friends, you know, that then work for me just in, friends who have amazing, um, amazing professional art practices themselves um, that come and work and just like, you know, I made sure to have some of them smiling and some of them like look like they're in agony, just so you know, the reality. Um, and um, so, oh yes, so I put, um, so this is actually the like the wrecking ball that sort of tore the church down that kind of looks like a buoy. Um, and also it was a piece from one of the stained glass windows in the church. Um, and then I hid, um, well, so 
the um, all the work, sorry, all the work I was doing in the in the chapel before it was turned down. I called that that body of work um, "Fall of a Seabird" or Ru "Ruina um, Maris of M" or "Ruina of M Maris." I think it sometimes was written too in Latin. So this work, um, I started calling it um, "The Seabird Ascends" or um, "Of M Maris S and D." Um, and I put, I made a basketball to go with it that has the magical feather because I started, when I started working on this court, I started seeing feathers on the street every day, um, like just more and more all the time. And I felt like I was getting these kind of positive, positive messages from the seabird. Um, so I made a basketball that has the shining um, iridescent uh, feather to give your ball air, give your free throw air. And then on one of the sides, I guess you can't see it from here, it says Ava Maris SMD. Uh, awesome D on the on the side of the ball, and um, these these are some of the nautical flags um, that together spell kind of a prayer um, and, a, and, a, and like an anti gentrification spell. So it goes. Um, uh, it's not the exact same. This is the this is what I rewrote as the hail. I rewrote the hail Mary as a like a nautical um, prayer, um, and so part of Part of this is in the is in the spell and it goes I think it goes Ave Maris wave why am I forgetting the first line of it anyway, it says wave of grace oh I know what it is sorry it's bird a sea because that's like bird headed for the sea bird a sea wave of grace brace brace so that's what it says in these nautical flags um and you can see the shadow of the seabird above. And it's also very close to the airport and you see planes flying over all the time. And Brace Brace is um, like a code um, for like the plane is, is going, is headed for the ocean. Like the plane might crash in the ocean. So it's kind of a warning too, to just um, the way we're treating cities and the land in general, um, building things very quickly, not sustainably, et cetera. So, um, so I will finish up very quickly because I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but um, I have been making a lot of work about my relationship to the rosary, which again, is very complicated. I've, I've left and come back to at different times, changed words, returned to the old words, et cetera. But there's kind of this, um, uh, there's like a re, uh, reclaiming and a reframing, I think that's happening right now with the rosary. And, um, a lot of people are starting to work with it again. And I think, um, you know, it has to do with also realizing that we need to kind of listen to the land and the earth mother and all of that. Um, and I am part of a queer rosary circle um, and often pray the rosary with a couple of my friends that are like non-binary um, queer Italian Americans. Um, and so we've been making our own rosaries. And this is the one that I made here with a little bell on the end and the prayer that I made to go with it. Um, and I started offering um, siren call, kind of like tarot readings, like shell oracle and, and tarot readings um, that kind of come out of that. And so I'll say the prayer um, and read uh, shells for people from a deck that was made by a shell scientist from Massachusetts named Shelly. Um, <laughs> And uh, so that's been, you know, another way to, um, you know, that's like a, a, side, a side hustle, um, you know, but it's been actually really beautiful. I think it in some ways started as a experimental kind of performance, but it's just very clear that the work is bigger than me and it's, it's, help, it's helping people in a way and people are getting something they need from it. So I continue to offer these readings and, um, and I do study cards and I am a tarot reader as well. Um, here's just like an example of one of the spreads from my sexy mermaid decks. <laughs> um, so, so the most recent body of work, Counting to Infinity, is about the process of praying the rosary and, and how that kind of unending cycle is like a process of, and, and I don't want to assume everyone knows to, how to pray the rosary, but, you know, there's a lot of um, bead-based prayer practices all over the world. I mean, Buddhism, I know, I know of as well. And, you know, it's just a, a repetitive chanting process where you count, um, but you, you can count, you count with your hands and you pray with your hands. And in this book that I'm reading about reclaiming the rosary, it's called the way of the, or I read, I read it called the way of the rose. There's a pretty cool passage about how, um, 
like if you think about hunting and gathering and if you think about hunting as potentially like, like historically a more masculine practice and gathering is a historically a more feminine practice hunting might be um, associated with meditation and this practice of like sitting still quietly in the woods waiting for an animal to show up whereas gathering is kind of like this constant ongoing um like multitasking and tactile um, practice. And so, you know, it's like uh, grandmothers could be doing the laundry and making dinner and muttering and, and talking and all the while still praying. And I really relate to that because I think both are valuable and important, but I struggle to meditate and sit still, if you can't tell. And um, so I really like this sort of idea of tactile prayer and using the body and not um, like removing the body from the soul, which like many Christian faiths have tried to then do. So um, I made the rosary while watching the movie Contact. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about it, but then I was like, of course. Um, you know, I've, and, then, and then I basically since then started making the rosary about space and space exploration. Well, when I say exploration, I don't mean like millionaires going to space, but like exploring it with your mind and, and soul. Um, <laughs> So I collected all of the rocks around my apartment that I, I didn't even realize I have just over walks throughout my life. I've been picking up stones and it's cool because you usually pick up a stone. There's whatever reason that you keep it, but a lot of times it fits in your hand in a certain way. And that's like what, why you're attracted to it. So I put, I corralled all of my stones from my apartment um, with the intention of making them into a rosary. Um, and I was thinking a lot about this, this like, dwarf planet, sednoid, trans-Neptunian object. It has a lot of different names, kind of a planet named Sedna, um, who was named after the Inuit sea goddess who was like banished to the depths of the sea and is kind of like a nautical um, underworld uh, figure. Um, the planet Sedna was named after her and Sedna has this insane almost 12,000 year orbit where it almost entirely leaves our solar system and comes back again. So it really, you know, it's like when you're grappling with infinity and you're just grappling with these numbers and distances, I think about Sedna. I've been making altars to her this year. So um, with Sedna in mind on the Pisces new moon, I put all of the stones from my apartment in the bathtub <laughs> and I put like, I, I put the rosary in there and I like made them all get clean and played a bunch of like planetary noises over them, did a bunch of like witchy stuff and, um, and then, so brought them, there are two iterations of this show, Counting to Infinity. The first one I did in Nashville, Tennessee, my hometown. It was the first show um, in my hometown. Um, I photographed each of the stones in my hands, um, you know, as a gesture, like you're praying the rosary going bead to bead. But when I was young, um, when I didn't have my rosary, I used to pray on my fingers a lot. And I really love that, that you don't actually need anything at all to be, to have a spiritual or magical practice. And so when I was in my twenties, I actually started making these drawings where I would color in the fingers and it was sort of my way of counting. So, um, so I photographed my hands with the stones and then I took the stones out, like photographed the empty hand with the shape of the stone still in it, and then colored the fingers in. In the rosary, there are, there are five sets of 10 Hail Marys. Um, there are five decades and then there are some beads that kind of lead you up and beads in between. So um, I did five sets of the 10 fingers, if this is making sense, colored in the fingers. So I'm like counting to infinity, I'm really counting to 50, but lined them around the room um, with the um, Sedna like ro stone rosary in the center. Um, and uh, this video I made in Iceland where I'm dancing in this stone boat that would just appear in the middle of the day when the tide went low enough um, in the lagoon at this residency I was doing. So um, this whole body of work, I'm thinking about the idea of antiphony, which is like a musical term for call and response. So this piece on the ground is called terrestrial antiphony. This is celestial antiphony. And this is lunar antiphony. Um, and so then I was lucky enough to bring this work to Venice, Italy in a show that Dana Clancy is an amazing artist and curator and educator, um, 
invited me to be in. And Dana, I don't know if you know about this, but this is like my statement when I was adding it to our, to our PDF for the gallery, it took off running. Like it just started multiplying itself a million times. And I had to shut down the whole program to get it to stop. So it's like counting to infinity, it just keeps going. going. <laughs> so um, I call that like my, my shooting statement. Um, and so I basically decided to turn the the hand drawings into a deck of cards. There is a game in Italy in the time, a, a traditional Italian card game called Scopa, which means broom to sweep or that other word. I got in trouble once for saying that in a lecture, so I'm not gonna say it. Um, but um, so I really liked the idea that I could create these cards um, and instead of including the numerals, include the, the, the fingers. So um, in an Italian playing card deck, you have sort of like the ace through 10, but you have um, eight, nine, and 10 are usually page, queen, king, or page, knight, king. Um, the way I came, the way I found out about Scopa in the first place is I found this card, the Fante de Spade, the, the page of swords at the bottom of the Adriatic Sea in 2017, no joke, off of Croatia. So that was what led to my fascination. But I decided to change the three court cards. So instead of being the page, knight, and queen, I have it as the planet, Mercury, Marte, and Venere, Venus, and in Italian. Um, so these cards, um, I made posters of them. The cards are because scopa means to sweep. I put them on like um, Cosmotesco Italian floors um, and made posters. Um, these are the different suits. So this would be like associated with swords, but here it's obelisks. These are all things you can make from stone. Um, and these are updated suits of things I took photos of when I was in Italy, by the way. So you have cups or wells. Which is the element? Which is the element water? Then you have obelisks, which would be swords, the element of air. Then you have pyramids, which are now becoming pine cones, uh, which would have been um, um, clove, uh, clover, um, and that's fire. This would be coins. I turned it into gravestones, the element of earth, and labyrinths. I added a fifth suit so that I could have the number of of cards be the number of beads in a rosary. Um, labyrinths is like the element of spirit, like the alchemical element of spirit and added some asteroids because they're kind of like rocks of the sky. This way they account for the other beads in the rosary. And this is um, Dana and I like went around uh, Milan and other parts of Venice scattering the cards on the floor. Um, and I found out that the um, Chinese astronomers, well, who were astrologers, they used to be the same thing. Um, they used to refer to comets with a, a Chinese, with Chinese characters that translate into English as sweeping stars or broom stars. So um, in the piece in Venice, I made handmade brooms that are kind of like comets and they're also the, they're sort of like the Zamboni drivers that come in and sweep the, the cards off the floor after you're finished playing Scopa. Um, I found, uh, Dana actually reminded me that these brooms are all over Venice, these really awesome handmade brooms. So I just made kind of, I'm not a broom maker, but I made these sort of crude usable brooms in the kind of Venetian style. Um, and we had cool workshops teaching people about tarot and playing for history and learning to play Scopa. The idea is that you sweep the cards off the floor. Um, you don't always play on the floor, but I like to. So here are some of the photos of the exhibition. The posters went on the wall. And um, I'm in the middle right now of making these into a playable deck. So that will not be ready for the Boston Art Book Fair, but it will be ready soon. Um, and then I named each of the brooms after Italian um, astronomers who all discovered different comets and then labeled them with the, the Venere, the, Venere, the, Venere, the um, Venus cards and put them on the steps of some of my favorite churches in Venice so that um, the Mary's trapped inside could have a getaway vehicle if she wanted. <laughs> this is Chiesa di Santa Maria Rosario, the rosary. This is a Maria of Health, Maria del Salute, the Lorto, the garden, del Giglio, Lily, the Miracoli, 
miracles. Yeah. So, um, so that so soon people will be able to buy the posters and the cards. And then I've also made a. Uh, Y'all are the first to see this. <laughs> a new babal um, based on the cosmic court. Um, honoring Sedna, the planet I mentioned earlier, um, as well as Senda, who is the founder of women's basketball at Smith College. Awesome. So there will be a zine coming with the ball um, and an essay about Sedna that I'm writing, and an essay about Senda that my friend Abigail is writing. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention about Sedna is she is nearing her perihelion, so she's also coming closer to Earth for the first time in um, about 12,000 years, and she's supposed to bring the fall of the patriarchy and rebalance the, like, set the gender balance, so <laughs> get ready. Okay, I'm, that was a lot. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs>